So I will solve this problem. And as I said, we are, we are going to solve it for the proper class. That is boosts and rotations, so that we can start with the infinitesimal and eventually integrate it or exponentiate it, either way, in whichever language you are using. So, consider the infinitesimal case. For both lambda and this. Lambda is the infinitesimal lambda, we know what it is. It is I plus delta omega times lambda. That little lambda one is the anti-symmetric one, so it is the, in the matrix notation, identity plus the parameter itself times the lambda. And how do I construct the S for the inf? S of lambda. F. Well, it should deviate from 1. Because when that parameters go to 0, it should reduce to 1. And the amount, the, the, the amount which is additional amount should be proportional to the infinitesimal parameter, delta omega. And it should involve the capital lambda's relevant term, that is lambda. And as it is at a tensor, so this is a Lorentz scalar. It's a matrix in the spinor space, but it doesn't carry any Lorentz index. Therefore, that should be compensated by another Lorentz tensor second rank so that this is contracted to make it Lorentz scalar. Now, why did I put a gap in here? I could have written plus that. But in order everything to come out cleanly in, in the direction of expectations, we introduce that as minus i over 4 here. That's the definition. And we take it to be the minus. As I said, there is nothing against writing plus times 1 and everything else. So that this is the unknown which is to be determined. Therefore, it would, be, it would carry an additional extra factor of minus 4 over i. So that only affects the definition in here. So I define the infinitesimal s as such. What is the s inverse of lambda? As it is s of lambda inverse, And I have to remember, what is the infinitesimal form of the lambda inverse? It is i minus lambda. Therefore, this expression will have the form inf i plus i over 4 delta omega. Because I replaced, when, when you go from lambda to lambda inverse, you just replace the lambda with the minus lambda. That's how it is. So these are the S, S inverse and lambda for the infinitesimal case that I have constructed. I have to substitute this in the equation that we have found. Let me do that. So identity plus i over 4 delta omega lambda mu nu sigma mu nu times gamma. Oh, by the way, now we have to be careful with the indices. Alpha, beta, alpha, beta, they are contracted. And this gamma mu is free, so it shouldn't have any partner it should be just mu in here and times s to the right with the minus sign i identity minus i over 4 delta omega 
lambda alpha beta, sigma alpha beta. If you say just be careful, then I be careful and use even further different set of indices. Alpha beta, alpha beta, contracted, rho sigma, rho sigma, contracted, mu is free, which is going to appear in the right hand side, lambda mu nu, lambda is this expression, delta mu nu, plus delta omega, lambda mu nu, gamma nu. It looks a bit complicated, but it's not. You have to be just careful in the S's that you have constructed an S in the indices. You substitute that into that simple equation, that's all. And it's infinitesimal, therefore you retain all the first order terms. What are the first order terms in the left hand side? Identity times gamma times identity is the first leading term, so it's gamma mu. The, there are the cross terms. Second term, gamma, identity, or identity, gamma, the second term. So, plus I over 4 delta omega, delta omega, lambda alpha beta, sigma alpha beta, gamma mu, minus gamma mu, lambda rho sigma, sigma rho sigma. That's the second group of terms, so-called cross terms. And then the delta omega, delta omega terms, delta omega squared. So it is second order. Delta omega squared is equal to what is the right hand side? Right hand side is gamma mu plus delta omega lambda mu nu gamma nu. Notice that gamma mu in the left hand side, gamma mu in the right hand side, they cancel. And second order terms are already thrown away. And so this cross term should vanish to be zero. Sorry, the second term, that is the, the cross term, the delta omega terms in both sides should be equal to each other in short. So let me equate them. I over four, I over four. Delta omegas are common, I cancel them. So lambda alpha beta, lambda alpha beta, sigma alpha beta, gamma mu, minus gamma mu, again let me now change the notation to alpha beta, alpha beta, alpha beta, sigma alpha beta is equal to lambda mu nu, lambda mu nu, gamma nu. This equation is the equation which help, which will help me to determine the sigmas, right? These are the, again, looking at the definition in here. S is the matrix in the spinor space. Let's put a twiddle underneath. Identity is the four dimension, identity in the spinor space. This is the parameter. This is the Lorentz tensor collection of numbers. This is both a tensor and a matrix in the spinor space. So let me underline the matrices. And these are just collection of numbers, Lorentz, components of Lorentz tensor. Let me move it out and the remaining becomes a commutator. I over 4, lambda alpha beta, commutator of sigma alpha beta gamma mu is equal to lambda mu nu gamma nu. Again, let me underline the matrices in the spinor space so that we can distinguish the components of tensors coming from the Lorentz space and the matrices. 
Let's check the indices, first of all. When you see such a complicated, really complicated expression, the first thing you have to check is the indices. Alpha, beta, alpha, beta contracted mu is the free index. Mu is the free index. Mu and mu are contracted. Indeed, consistent. You know, we have to really check that the free indices in both sides are the same. And now, uh, how do I convert everything into each other? So let's be, let me be careful in here so that I can solve it. I will do the following. Notice that this is new and new. Lambda, as I said, are the tensors which is from the Lorentz space. The second index I would like to set to the equal to this one. So that I can see easily. Now there is a mu in here. Mu is free. However, I can convert mu into alpha beta. How? I can write this as G G E G G G mu alpha lambda alpha beta. Can I? Beta I don't touch. There's a free index mu. I using this raising uh, mu alpha, alpha is contracted, then it goes up as mu. This is an identity. So these are nice trick of the uh, metric tensor. So what do I have? I have managed to make this lambda alpha beta, which is from another space. I am in the spinor space. These tensors are coming from the Lorentz space to make it the same thing to appear in the right hand side. So I write it as lambda alpha beta times g mu alpha gamma beta. That's what is left over. Notice then they are the same. Isn't that nice that we, we, with this nice trick, simple and nice trick, we made the same alpha beta appearing in the equation. Lambda alpha beta is arbitrary. Therefore, if I write everything as lambda alpha beta times something's alpha beta contracted is equal to zero, as these are non-zero and arbitrary, the coefficient of this thing, the entire thing, I moved everything to the left lambda and factor lambda alpha beta. And this should be equal to zero. So what is that thing? That thing are the really simply, if you use this simple reasoning, the coefficient of lambda alpha beta in both sides should be equal to each other. That's in plain English, that's what I am saying. So let me write that down. And then we will then solve the new equation that we will obtain. Okay, what is it then? I over 4 sigma alpha beta gamma mu is equal to g mu alpha gamma beta. Well, actually, I should have done something a little more than this. So it is not fully correct, it's half correct. What do I mean? Let me go back to this equation now. What was lambda alpha beta? We have previously demonstrated that lambda alpha beta is anti-symmetric, right? As a result of the definition relation of the Lorentz matrices. This is anti-symmetric, therefore, this must be anti-symmetric, which is sort of implicit in this definition. Anti-symmetric and anti-symmetric. If there was a symmetric part in it, that symmetric part would be uh, killed by the anti-symmetry in here. So that is obvious in here. So that is anti-symmetric in alpha beta. Alpha beta. But this thing is not anti-symmetric in alpha beta. This is an arbitrary. So I, have, I can write this as Th 
linear superposition of two parts, symmetric and anti-symmetric, right? So I can write this as G mu alpha gamma beta minus G mu beta gamma alpha divided by two plus, that's an identity which we had used previously several times, mu alpha gamma beta plus G mu beta gamma alpha divided by two. That's an identity, right? Correct? Because the second terms cancel and the first terms are one half plus one half. It's one. It's an identity. But that identity solves us one thing. The second term, which is symmetric in alpha beta, cancels against this because this is anti-symmetric. That's the entire thing is symmetric. It's zero. So only this thing gives a contribution. So the right hand side is really not that, but the following. Isn't this nice? That's really beautiful. So this equation is really the one which is going to solve us for the sigma alpha beta gamma mu is equal to four by so minus two i gamma g mu alpha gamma beta minus g mu beta gamma alpha. So what I have to do next is solve this. Use it, solving this equation to determine the sigma. Obviously it's a very complicated equation. It's not so easy to solve this. You have to really use a lot of imagination in here. First of all, sigma from the very construction is anti-symmetric in alpha beta. And what are the possible tensors that I have in this spinor space? I have G alpha beta, gamma alpha, gamma beta, that's all really, these products I have. If I am looking for second rank anti-symmetric tensors, well this is symmetric already, so it cannot give any contribution. And these kind of products, only the commutator type of combination of this can give a contribution because out of these products I can write gamma alpha gamma beta or gamma alpha gamma beta. Well, this is already the same as gamma beta. So that's out, that's symmetric. So it looks as if in this spinor space, I have the only likely candidate to be used as a possible solution to this equation is the commutator of gamma alpha and gamma beta with an arbitrary constant c. So I write the sigma alpha beta as c times gamma alpha gamma beta because the anti-symmetric forced me to choose this particular tensor. Then take this and substitute in that equation and determine the c really. That's the only job that is left after this guessing of the correct result. Okay. Okay. So if I now substitute this in, what do I have in the left hand side? So C times commutator of gamma mu, gamma nu, gamma, al sorry, alpha beta, because that's sigma alpha beta that I'm looking for. The right hand side is minus 2i times that. Now, 
what is the algebra that I have in my hand? The algebra is the Clifford algebra, right? The algebra of anti-commutators. Did I really work that out? No, I haven't. Perhaps I should work that out now. What is the gamma al algebra? When we were working out the four-dimensional form of the Dirac matrices, Dirac equation, four-dimensional form, we have introduced these gammas. Let me remind you what those gammas are. Gamma zero is beta, gamma i super is beta alpha i. We have the alpha and beta algebras, right? Alpha squared for all i is 1, beta squared all i is 1, alpha i for any i anti commutes with beta, alpha i with alpha j anti commutator is twice delta ij. There is this crowded algebra which enabled us to write those particular matrix representations. Now, the beautiful thing is that in this four dimensional no notation, these new gammas satisfy the following algebra. Well, before proceeding any further to, uh, to solve our equation, let's verify indeed that this is the correct algebra. How do I really verify that this is the correct algebra? We can look at the 0, 0, component first, and ii component for given i, and then ij components and 0i component. There are several things that I need to check. What is the 0, 0? Gamma 0, gamma 0 is 2 gamma 0 squared. 2's cancel, and gamma 0 squared is 1. Is this something that we know? Perhaps I, I put it like that to be on the safe side. Well, gamma zero is beta. This gives me beta squared is one. So it reproduces this one. Let me now check, say, one, one. I don't like this going to the particular indices, but not to confuse you any further with the complication of the indices, let's do that. One, one, for instance. And you can, whatever we find for the one, one will be valid for two, two, and three, three. Instead of saying, let's look at i, i, but no summation of i, when there is no summation of i, we have to indicate. Repeated indices are always summed over, except in the case of warning, no summation. In, but in order not to confuse you, let me consider 1, 1. I have 2 gamma 1 squared, right? Is equal to 2 g mu nu. 1, 1 is minus 1, so minus 2 i. 2 is cancel. And I have gamma 1 squared is minus 1, so is gamma 2 squared, so is gamma 3 squared. So whatever I do for gamma 1 is valid for 2 and 3. But what is gamma 1? It is beta times alpha 1. So beta times alpha 1 times beta times alpha 1. It's, it's a square, right? If you jump beta over much better to use the Cartesian label now because we said for the axis alphas there is no up or down so super or lower indices distinction we use the Cartesians only if I jump beta over alpha x I get a minus sign right minus beta times alpha x beta squared is 1 alpha x squared this this becomes minus alpha x squared so right hand side is minus 1 so I have proven the fact that alpha x squared is 1. There's a minus in the left, minus in the right. So the same argument holds for alpha y squared is 1, alpha z squared is 1. So 1, 1, 2, 2, or 3, 3 proves the, that all the alpha, all the three alphas have squares 1. Now let's consider the 0, 1, for instance. What do I have? Gamma 0, gamma 1, plus gamma 1, gamma 0. Right hand side, g, 0, 1 is 0. 
Gamma 1 is what? Beta. Yeah. yeah the, well, let me do the following. Let me multiply this with gamma 0 further from left. And use the fact that gamma 0 squared is 1. So I have gamma 1 plus gamma 0, gamma 1, gamma 0 is 0. It's much better. What was gamma 1? Gamma 1 was gamma 0 times alpha x. Gamma 0 squared is 1. So gamma 0 times alpha x plus alpha x times gamma 0 is equal to 0. Or let's even write it beta alpha. Okay. Alpha x beta is equal to 0. So this is proven. The 0 1 gave me beta alpha x plus alpha x beta is equal to 0. So if I repeat the same for 0, 2, and 0, 3, I will get beta alpha y, alpha y beta, beta alpha z, alpha z beta is equal to 0. Finally, let's take the 1, 2, or 2, 3, or 1, 3, doesn't matter. Let's take the 1, 2. 1, 2 is gamma 1, gamma 2, plus gamma 2, gamma 1, this is 0. So this is beta alpha x, beta alpha y, the first term. Beta alpha y, <coughs> beta alpha x is equal to 0. Jump beta over alpha x and use beta squared is 1. So the left, this, this term is minus alpha x minus alpha y and this one jump over again use beta squared one minus alpha y alpha x is equal to zero alpha x alpha y alpha y alpha x is zero so again this other algebra is reproduced so this algebra a beautiful algebra contains all the information concerning <coughs> alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3, and beta, all the algebra, that, that sort of unesthetic looking crowded algebra is reproduced by this single equation, which is called the Clifford algebra. Now I'm going to use this extensively to, f to finish this and determine the C. Our job is to determine the C. So what is the left-hand side there? Left-hand side is C gamma alpha gamma beta, gamma mu, which is gamma alpha, gamma beta, gamma mu, minus, yes, gamma beta, gamma alpha, gamma mu. Now, I would like to use the Clifford algebra, which involves anti-commutators. Therefore, I need to use an identity which converts commutators into anti-commutators. That's the subtlety in here. That is, I'm going to use the following algebra. Let me consider this. A, B, C, commutator. Well, if it, I decompose it in terms of the commutators, it's easy left term to the left, right term to the right, and the remaining commutators are added up. But I want to decompose it in terms of the anti-commutators, which is A, B, C, minus A, C, B. The orders are important. Notice that. Left factor to the left, and remaining anti-commutator, minus right factor to the right, 
but minus the remaining anti-commutator. If it was the commutator, these were commutators, there would be a plus in here. You can verify this immediately. Let's check. ABC plus ACB minus ACB plus CAB. ABC, ACB, ABC, yeah. What is left over is ACB minus CAB. Is this what left, left hand side is indeed? So ABC minus CAB. Indeed, verify. That's a, it's a two minutes exercise. So let me use this decomposition, which gives me what for the first commutator? Gamma alpha, gamma beta, gamma mu is gamma alpha, anti commutator of gamma beta, gamma mu, minus anti commutator of gamma alpha, gamma mu, gamma beta. Okay, that's the decomposition. Now let me use the Clifford algebra. The Clifford algebra for this is twice G beta mu identity. This one twice G alpha mu identity. Or what I have found for this right hand side is, for this term is twice G beta mu gamma alpha minus G alpha mu gamma beta. You see the point, right? This is the first term in the left-hand side, and the second term in the left-hand side will be replacing alpha with beta with a minus sign. Replace alpha with beta with a minus sign. This becomes alpha with a minus sign, and that becomes alpha beta with a minus sign. Converts this into a four. The entire difference, this minus that, gives me a 4. So the result is 4 C times gamma beta mu gamma G beta mu gamma alpha G alpha mu gamma beta. That's the left-hand side. What is the right-hand side? Right-hand side is that one. minus 2i g alpha mu alpha gamma beta g mu beta gamma alpha if I set left hand side equal to right hand side what do I get? 4, 4 c Four C is equal to plus two I, right? Because that term is in the first, and this term is in the yeah. That's in the first, so minus and minus gives you two I. The beta mu is the first term plus, and that's plus. Isn't this beautiful? So we have been able, using solving that equation, that we have proven that sigma mu nu is i over 2 gamma mu gamma nu. So I have been able to determine the s for the infinitesimal case. Let me write again the s in the infinitesimal case. The identity minus i over Four was it? Yeah, it was I over four. <coughs> and this sigma now mu nu is this. So I know we have we, but we have as S in the spinor space for the infinitesimal case. How do we go to the finite case to get 
finite. We need to integrate or exponentiate. Okay, let's do that. We have to get a sequence of infinitesimal next to each other. Delta omega, another delta omega, another delta omega, another delta omega, delta omega goes to zero. You act in a sequence. So to get the finite, S is limit delta omega goes to zero times I, actually, say N goes to infinity. And the full parameter finite transformation is omega divided by n. So i over 4 omega over n. This I replace with the omega over n. Sigma mu nu lambda mu nu times n. Each one is this. And I do it n times and then let n goes to infinity to go from infinitesimal to the finite. And then we have to remember the following definition of exponential operator. It is limit n goes to infinity 1 minus a over n to n. This is one definition of the exponential. There are other definitions, of course. If it was a plus exponential, I would have a plus sign underneath in that order. So what do I get from here then? It is e to the minus i over 4 omega sigma mu nu lambda mu nu. Lambda is the one which is you are carrying over from the Lorentz space. You have to remember. This implies, this is coming from the That is the parametrization of the capital lambda, so that indeed in the infinitesimal case, i plus delta omega lambda, right? So it is consistent with our definition. This lambda, which is an anti-symmetric tensor. This was the infinitesimal I was using, so if you exponentiate it to get the finite, it is e to the omega times lambda. And this is the finite form of the spinner, the transformation in the spinner space. And sigma mu nu is obtained. In, I let me write it once more. I over two gamma mu gamma nu. Both indices are up. So we have been able to really prove covariance provided that we carry out the transformation, we transfer the information from one frame to the other on the spinners with this S transformation. Okay, that's a good point to stop. And we are going to do explicit. We, we will consider the explicit for the cases of boosts, rotations in Lorentz space, and in the spin or space.